I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. As always, incredible things happening globally. Stacy. Hey, Max. Well, guess what? China will dominate AI unless U.S. invest more. Commission warns so AI is artificial intelligence, and the commission is headed by Eric Schmidt, the former head of Google. Well, apparently, you know, because essentially U.S. corporations and shareholders don't allow R&D, don't allow investment into the economy, don't allow innovation to happen, that's bad. They don't want production. They just want stock buybacks, right? They want all the money to go to stock buybacks, load the company up with debt. Well, they have to go to the government, and they're looking for the government instead to do, the, i.e., the taxpayer, to take all the risk of innovation. They will get to keep the reward. But this one thing really stood out to me here because of our experience of moving from Europe to the United States in the past few years. Eric Schmidt says, China already holds the lead in some areas, including some aspects of payment technology and facial recognition. While mass surveillance may not be an area where the U.S. needs to be ahead of China, Schmidt said, he is concerned that China has a five-year lead in e-commerce systems and electronic payments. I think that's a very big deal, he said. It's like, you know, Walmart gets the government to pay their employees. Right. Walmart doesn't pay their employees. The government pays Walmart's employees so that the people at Walmart who run Walmart can take more money for themselves. So now what's going on here is that these tech companies want the American taxpayer to go fund some AI, some artificial intelligence for them. Uh, they don't want to spend the money on the AI themselves because they want to keep it. Uh, for their stock bonuses. They don't want to do any actual work. They just want the transfer payments from the Fed, put it in their pockets. And then if there's a complaint about, oh, China's leading in AI, they're like, oh, go talk to the taxpayer. We're just company. We're just corporations. We don't know how to do anything anymore. So, yeah, in terms of Walmart, uh, their employees get paid because they themselves, the employees don't get paid well enough to not receive food stamps, to not receive welfare benefits, and to not receive free health care through Medicaid. So that's how uh, Walmart taps the taxpayer. Here, they're also, the, the actual financialized system that we have now is like, even if, you know, the heads of any of these companies wanted to do something, wanted to invest in their company, the stockholders would not allow them. They would be totally punished. They would be hit by hostile like, you know, Paul Singer sort of investors who would come in and say, why is this guy investing in, in actually research? Like, what is this guy, a madman? Like, let's get rid of this CEO. So they can't even do that. Like, it's not even set up. He, he, Eric Schmidt doesn't, of course, he likes that system because he's done well out of it, but he doesn't want to tell the population that this, would, this is actually what happens, why we can't have innovation in this country, and yet China seems to be able to have so much innovation. That's right. Eric Schmidt doesn't want to spill the beans, you know, because it's an unpalatable truth. You know, it's an inconvenient truth that you just can't actually get that innovation in the U.S. anymore because all the corporations that are in a position to innovate are pilfering shareholders and pilfering the taxpayers and using financial leisure domain on Wall Street to line their pockets. They're not interested. They can't be bothered. It's like if Paris Hilton ran the S&P 500, she wouldn't really be bothered by all of this. And that's the way these leaders at the S&P 500 are saying, like, I want to go find my little doggies out in the park. I don't care about the American worker. I don't care about the American economy. I only care about me, 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 because I'm a narcissistic kleptomaniac that somehow got this job and I steal every single moment of every single day. And that's my job. I do want to point out as well, China's not just five years ahead of the US in terms of payments, payment technology, right? London, I would say living there, it's about 10 years ahead of what the United States is. So I know for a fact that Asia is way ahead of Europe. So uh, who knows how far ahead they are. I think this is this is where you sit. This is a sales pitch, right? Eric Schmidt is trying to get money for his cronies. And you don't want to say the problem's insurmountable. You can't get there from here. And so you're saying, oh, we're just like five years. It's easy to close that gap. Just need half a trillion and we'll <laughs> close that little gap. <laughs> right, it is a sales pitch, just like when uh, Tim Geithner and Hank Paulson went to Congress and said, we, we don't want a trillion dollars for the 2008 the crisis. We want $750 billion, and they ended up spending $17 trillion. Now we're going to move on to the next headline about this, in a way. The tweet image is, Bitcoin could be the new currency for global trade. 
Citibank says. Of course, that's Dorian Nakamoto. We often have an image of him hanging here. And this is the much talked about report out of Citibank that many um, academic economists were uh, very upset with. But basically what Citibank is saying, and they're one of the biggest recipients of bailouts in American history <laughs> and part of this financial system whereby, um, you know, China's eating their lunch and payment system because the likes of Citibank never bothered to uh, get out of bed. They wouldn't get out of bed for $10,000. You know, they, they can't be bothered to come up with any innovations. Well, they, in a report entitled Bitcoin at the Tipping Point, it charts the evolution of Bitcoin from a form of payment to its current status as the store of value. The authors forecast that Bitcoin's core properties combined with its global reach and neutrality could see it morph into the currency of choice for international trade in around seven years. It's happening right now because the transaction is the settlement. So you don't need Citibank. It obviates Citibank. It makes Citibank redundant, as are all banks, redundant with Bitcoin. I can trade with you as a currency and it uh, doesn't require any bank, doesn't require a central bank. And th they got a little bit reversed. They're saying it started off as a means of payment and people are looking at it as a store of value. But in fact, it started off as a store of value and now it's morphing into a means of payment. That's the whole history of money. So Citibank should know at least the history of money and how money comes into existence. But nevertheless, a good effort and I applaud them for at least recognizing that they're about to go out of business. But being involved in Bitcoin early in those days, there were many participants who thought it was like, we're gonna compete with PayPal, we're gonna compete with Visa. It's gonna be a, a settlement, you know, it's gonna be uh, used for as a means of exchange like that. As you point out, it was actually always a store of value. And in fact, they point out the perceptions. They say perceptions about what makes Bitcoin important continue to evolve and create new opportunities while increasing its perception towards becoming mainstream. It's becoming more mainstream because people's perceptions, i.e. the thing that the Fed, Jerome Powell, is always trying to manage perceptions, right? They, that's what they Fed speak is all about. They go out there to speak to the market and say, don't worry, we're going to take care of inflation. Don't worry, we're not printing too much money. You might perceive it if you look over there, like at the food costs, like you might perceive it as a bad situation. But listen to me, I'm, I'm, you know, massaging your perception about the situation. Well, here the situation is being perceived as being a better store of value than the U.S. dollar, and perceived by international um, participants in the global market. Anybody who has anything to sell anywhere on any continent or any country on Earth. They're perceiving this as a more neutral, uh, better to use settlements layer. Right. There's what, $5 trillion a day in Forex market, foreign exchange. And that can be completely replaced with uh, a Bitcoin as the base layer. And we've seen that demonstrated uh, now uh, by sending uh, currency from country to country, uh, starting off in one currency, arriving at the destination in that local currency instantaneously, uh, virtually at no cost. Eric Schmidt pointed out that. China. He lied a little bit that China's only five years ahead of us in payment technology. You know, in London for well over five years ago, you could just tap your card, instant payment. You could transfer it to somebody instantly at another bank and another bank account. Here it takes up to six days to transfer from a bank account in America to another bank account. Well, they use the Pony Express, which is, <laughs> uh, we should be feeling good about those ponies. Right. So here, this is also the same country that oversees the global settlements layer. So everybody else in the world is already on a much faster system. And they're like, oh, now we have to go to the global part. Oh, the mm. slow molasses, having to deal with that system. So City points out that the report explains that Bitcoin and the role of a global trade currency could be used by importers and exports to pay for goods and services directly, simplifying the process of international trade. A decentralized cryptocurrency may be preferred to a central bank digital currency, it argues, because no government or outside entity can take steps that might affect the supply of the trade currency, helping to decouple trade from political considerations. Right, so they just threw the idea of central bank digital currencies under the bus. They're like, central bank digital currencies, by, by definition, are central. Therefore, they cannot compete with Bitcoin. So Citibank, again, just threw another industry under the bus. Yeah, I mean, uh, because, of course, the central bankers are going to look at this threat, uh, the competitor, a better competitor of Bitcoin, and say, well, how do we 
act like them? How do we, like, maybe we just form a blockchain. That's all you need, right? That's what it's all about. But no, it's the neutrality and the permissionless nature of it, censorship resistant, because this is another thing that as, you know, whoever controls that system, and it's a dollar system right now, like, obviously they were pretty fair and open about it when they were the world, they were outcompeted everybody. When we produced all the semiconductor chips, when we produced all the cars, when we produced all the high tech. But now that other countries are, are way ahead of us on, in, in some aspects, we're like, mm, eh, well, you know what? We're going to slow your payments down. That's how we can outcompete you. We're going to make it harder for you to even trade with anybody. So this is what Citibank is saying. They're agreeing with us. Once again, Kaiser Report was right. <laughs> Citibank was wrong until now. Yeah, and I mean, it's remarkable that it's an indictment on the bank, their very own bank. It's like yes. a mea culpa. It's like, you know what? We're finally going to admit something to you, everybody <laughs> in the world. What we do here is redundant, slow, costly, unnecessary, and uh, overly expensive, and a drag on the economy. And we're sorry. <laughs> we're sorry. That's what Citibank is saying. Yeah. Well, they're saying what Eric Schmidt said. It's like, we can't do it ourselves. Uh, taxpayer, you better do something about it or, or whatever. <laughs> we need another bailout. 2008 wasn't enough. Biggest bailout in history. No, no, no. We need another bailout because I have to work on my golf game. That's their that's their pitch to America. Okay, buddy. Sure. Well, who do I write the check out to? And by the time you get it, China and the rest of the world will be another light year ahead. Well, stay tuned for the second half. Much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time to go to Chris Fenton, author of Feeding the Dragon. Chris, let's get into it. Uh, as you point out in your book, Feeding the Dragon, uh, Hollywood, where you have uh, spent most of your career, it is really set the tempo. The global tempo for culture seems to be... Uh, I just saw that China reported their biggest box office month ever in history, and the theaters are full. What's going on? It's obviously the the business that you and I had first met in Hollywood, and it's a really unbelievable situation where last uh, month, February, which obviously had the Chinese New Year ho national holiday in there, the month itself did almost $2 billion U.S. in box office. Um, the disappointing part about that is the amount of money that Hollywood movies grossed during that period was a whopping $14 million of it. Um, there's two things that I've been very vocal about on the Hollywood front with its engagement to China. One is obviously the kowtowing and this ridiculous encroachment of our freedom of speech and censorship rights here in the United States, number one. But number two is one that can be extrapolated to every other business that's engaged with China out of the United States and our Western allies. And that's the fact that in order to get access to that market, we had to placate the government of China to get in there in the first place. And part of that was the ability to teach them our processes, to do tech swaps, to create joint ventures, and to get them to understand how we actually cre create these products and services that their consumers want. And now at this point, they are replicating it themselves and they are taking the market away from our own American companies because we've taught them too well. So Eric Schmidt, uh, former Google chair, he says that China has a five-year lead over the U.S. in e-commerce payments. China's already working on 6G, whereas U.S. has yet to roll out 5G. Uh, uh, the U.S. has no 5G. The product from Verizon is a hoax. They don't have 5G. So we borrowed $4 trillion last year, increased the money supply by 25%. It seems like we're, you know, really far behind on technology and we're Borrowing too much money, Chris. I mean, what? how is this playing in Washington? Are the alarm bells sounding or are they asleep at the switch? Your audience is awesome. It's super insightful. It's super tough on me. And the engagement with them has been a lot of fun and I've learned a lot. So first of all, I would love anybody that's listening to this to please follow me on the Dragon Feeder and give me whatever you want as far as opinion and criticism because I'm working on another book and we're actually adapting my book book, my present book, into a documentary. And I want to focus on how we can remedy this issue, how we can unite a very divided America in order to go after this Chinese challenge that we're facing. And to answer your question and to go upon what Eric was talking about, one of the things that China does is they play a long game. They play a 25, 50, 
hundred year game of chess while we play checkers all day long on share price fluctuations on a day-to-day -day basis, quarterly results, two to four year election cycles, et cetera. And that creates a real problem for us to invest in infrastructure and for us to invest in R&D. They are doing that great. And by the way, if you wanna look at case studies, the best ones to look at right now are 1993, when they said they are not gonna participate in our GPS, our, our global positioning satellite system. They were gonna create their own. And guess what? They have. In 1997, they said they are not gonna participate in the World Wide Web. Um, they wanted to create their own and bifurcate it from the rest of the world. Guess what? They have. They're doing the same thing with 5G and 6G, and they're gonna do it with microchips on their 2025 vision. We are getting left behind and we need to smarten up. One thing about Donald Trump, whether you liked him or hated him, he pulled the fire alarm and said, we need to wake up to this China challenge. Time is running out and we need to get serious about it. Whether he applied getting serious to it or not is one thing to debate. But what he did do is pull the fire alarm. We need to keep pulling it. We need to implement change now to address this. The quid pro quo though is, uh, you know, Chris, we get cheap stuff. You know, uh, we don't work. You know, we get transfer payments from the government. They sent us all this free cash to buy Chinese goods, which are super cheap. So why, what's my incentive? To, to, um, you're asking me to go back into the factory, work 60 hours a week, you know, and everything's gonna be more expensive because we can't get it from China anymore. So my quality of my life's gonna crash. What, what's the point of that? If, if Chinese are willing to do all the work and, and, get, and the government's willing to give us all free money, What's my incentive? In exchange, they're going to recut It's a Wonderful Life and make Jimmy Stewart a Chinese actor? I don't, I'm fine with that. I don't care. So what, what's, my, what's my upside in this? I mean, we've offshored essentially deflationary pressures because of the cheap labor over there, and that does allow us cheap products and services. The fact of the matter is, and all of your audience knows this really well because they're getting super wealthy off of it, and it's why Bitcoin is rising like it is, but there's a real push for China to remove the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. And once that happens, this whole great, oh, we don't have to work, everything is cheap, we can just print money into infinity, that all goes away. And then the really tough start happens on the reset. And unfortunately, at that point, China's gonna have a big head start on what that new world norm is gonna look like. And we're gonna be left behind in the dust. This is not something that we can literally sit and go, hey, look at how great our lives are today it's just going to continue like that. That is not the case. We've seen many canaries in the coal mine. There's lots of experts that are now coming out about it. And even those little sort of, oh, what do we care about censorship of Hollywood or whatever it is? Well, guess what? It's trickling throughout the world. They are dictating how we tell stories for other markets, including our own, not just theirs. And that is going across the board to every other American company. Just like they do it with Hollywood, they're doing it with Marriott and saying, you got to take Taiwan off of your map. They're doing it with Activision and saying, you can't show the trailer for your latest game because it has a little segment of the Tiananmen Square massacre in its incident in it. They are doing it with every one of our companies on freedom of speech rights, but even worse, they have taken our ability to be best in class at what we do they have learned from it because they've forced us to teach them how to do it. And now they are beating us at our own game and the stuff we were already world leaders in. And they're using that in order to be world leaders in things like you said, 6G, which we haven't even started to think about yet. President Biden has opted to do nothing about Mohammed bin Salam chopping up the Washington Post journalist and flushing him down the toilet. Um, you know, our leaders don't seem to really care about these issues, Chris. I, 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 I wish they did. Let me hit that really quick, okay? This is really interesting to me because I, if people have read my book, I did leak out there a little bit that I happen to be a Democrat, even though I don't really affiliate with either party. I'm a nonpartisan patriot. But if you look at the way we deal with MBS and the way we punish and the way we, we uh, even approach the human rights issues there, it tends to be something from the left 
that they go after because it's energy trade, it's defense contracting, military industrial complex that Saudi is all made up of. When you look at China, it's more left-leaning stuff. So the right gets tougher on it, right? You got the Nikes and you got the NBA, and you got Hollywood and you got Apple and Starbucks, more liberal-leaning corporate interests, right? What we need to do is combine forces and get a common challenge sort of protocol where we're actually bonding over something that's not this cultural warfare and who believes in gun rights and God and all that kind of stuff. We have a real threat here. We need to unite on it, be a solidarity formed united front to create the leverage to fix this. To your point about the U.S. dollar there, I, I, I noticed that Stan Druckenmiller, very famous money manager, he said he's going very, very short the dollar in long Asia. Okay, so money flows to where the returns are the greatest. And uh, so the money management industry doesn't seem phased by these issues, Chris. It's disheartening because quite frankly, our capital markets and our investor base is really what's powering the engine of China. Um, you know, I have no problem with capitalism. In fact, I love capitalism and I love free markets. And as you and I have discussed both online and offline. I don't even know if we really have capitalism. It's more of a cronyism uh, situation that I think is overtaking our capitalism system. But let's pretend we have capitalism. One thing that we need to think of in regards to the way we engage China now is on a patriotism first level and then capitalism. As long as we start to realize that our capitalism, the base of our capitalism, the base of the freedoms that we have in business have the foundation of a strong republic, the ability to have a United States of America that we built over the last 200 years and protect the security interests of and the welfare of, then that capitalism will continue to flourish. The problem is, is we've been selling out the nation that has allowed us to have this form of capitalism just for returns on quick quarterly results and P&Ls and revenue growths that are pumping up our stocks and making investors rich. It's as simple as the SEC, for instance. If you look at the way China gets access to our capital markets, they do not have to apply the same accounting standards as every other company around the world. Why? Because they hide behind state secrets laws, which they say apply to them, because technically all these private companies are SOEs, or state-owned enterprises. We've got to end that. If you want access to U.S. capital markets, if you want access to private equity, if you want access to M&A activity, we need to embolden CFIUS to be even stronger, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and we need to allow the SEC to patrol these Chinese companies and regulate them the exact same way every other company gets access to our markets. Which would be more effective, more impactful? for the U.S. government to get, quote, tough on China, or B, for the U.S. government to get tough on Wall Street that's engaged in all kinds of worthless stock buybacks, loading companies up with debt, hollowing out industries, private equity raiding these companies, making them less competitive or not competitive, creating zombie companies, rewarding zombie banks and serial recidivist lawbreakers on Wall Street, right? So the question is, which, which where we get the biggest bang for our tax buck? Clean up the Wall Street crooks or try to uh, manage China better? Where, where's the better dollar spent, Chris? There's a real need for the way we construct capital markets and the way we ex uh, created our exchanges way back in the day. But we have definitely lost our way in a lot of respects. And on top of it, the regulators and the revolving door that occurs between Wall Street and regulators is something that needs to get fixed. But the fact is, my lane is China. And if I wanted to get on to that Wall Street subject, I can go on all day long because it affected me and my family really hard. And I'm still upset about it. That's something that I can't get rid of. And I'm still <laughs> But the fact is, I'm also <laughs> about the way we're addressing China. And the fact that there's so much money being made on Wall Street by trying to put their heads in the sand and pretending like this isn't a long-term issue that's going to bite us in the is ridiculous and we need to address it from the government level and say these are the ground rules moving forward and there's simple simple fixes i mean 
WTO designating China as a developed nation is just simply one that will start to rectify the unfairness. Number two is the accounting practices that the SEC needs to start applying to Chinese companies. Number three is to make sure that we're actually overseeing these companies that are trying to get listed on, on the U.S. exchange and scrutinizing their, all of their paperwork to make sure it is right and appropriate for both retail investors and the large fish who are out there trying to make a lot of money on it. I mean, you look at TikTok and the big private equity interests in TikTok and that bite dance situation. And the fact is they were just trying to lay off a national security issue into something that created profits. Yeah, beautifully put. Feeding the Dragon is the title of the book. Chris Fenton, the author. Thanks for being on Kaiser Report. By the way, Max, sorry you got me all wound up, but this is really serious stuff, and we do have a ticking clock. Everybody, please engage in the book and follow me at, at the Dragon Feeder. Love being on the show. Have me back anytime. Yeah, will do. That's going to do it for this edition of Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank our guest, Chris Fenton. Until next time, bye, y'all. <laughs>